Cuban Hello and welcome to the Mutual Fund Show. My name is Neeraj Shah. Over the next um, 30 minutes, we talk all about mutual funds and discuss a whole host of issues. Uh, remember, as we've spoken about in our uh, teasers as well, uh, before you SIP, you should try and mitigate some of the risks that come in with an SIP. Nothing is risk-free, as we've always stated, and even mutual funds are not risk-free. Maybe they are lesser risky than equities, pure play equities, but even there, if there are risks, you should try and mitigate that. To talk about that, and the germination of idea came in essentially from an email that I received from them, and that is the house of Edelweiss, AMC. Radhika Gupta, the CEO of Edelweiss Mutual Fund, and Harsh Patwardhan, who is the CEO of equities of Edelweiss Asset Management. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining in. And um, good that I received that mail, because it gave me an idea for um, whether, you know, should we go about and tell people about a few risks that they should you know, kind of keep in mind. But you know, before we jump to the topic, something that we do now with every show is talk about that one key question, the big question uh, that we want to ask to our experts. And frankly, the last three or four days, you would have guessed what the big question would be. Yeah. And the big question is, and it'll come up on your screen, is what impact would the ILNFS bond exposure have on mutual fund schemes? Mm. Pratika, is it possible to uh, give, a, give an accurate answer about what could happen? So one, I don't think it's possible to give an accurate answer as to what could happen because I think every mutual fund in this kind of scenario will take uh, a very specific view and no one is one to judge whether that view is right or wrong. Let me tell you what an investor should do, in my opinion. I think an investor should be well informed. Uh, an investor should talk to his advisor uh, and an investor should talk to the asset management company in which case he holds the fund and I'm sure asset management companies will do whatever it takes to reach out as to what their plan is vis-a-vis -vis how to value the particular security. It depends on a lot of factors. Your course of action depends on a lot of factors. What in fund you're invested in, how much percentage is that downgraded security in that fund, what time horizon there is, what tax implication there are of exiting. So there actually is no right answer. Um, the second thing an investor should do is not panic in any kind of credit downgrade an event, uh, and we've seen a lot of them over the last few months. Remember that it is part of your portfolio. It's not all of your portfolio. So when you see the news and you see 20% markdown or 50% markdown, remember it's on a security that's part of your portfolio, not 100% of your portfolio. It might be 1% of your portfolio, in which case the panic might be absolutely unnecessary. It might be 5% of your portfolio. So don't panic too much. Ask for information, but everyone will do something different. Okay, yeah, it, it forms a part of mitigating risks, right? If you <laughs> indeed have this. Uh, just wondering, just one quick follow up before we move to the main topic. Um, if indeed uh, there are markdowns, uh -huh. I mean, how I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of a layman investor who's watching this show right now that I, I have an investment in a fund, XYZ yeah. fund, there they have exposure, the markdown has happened. Uh, does that mean that my NAV will now forever be uh, a factor of that, rem that, mark that markdown value or could there be some bit of recovery that could come in as well later on? Sure. So let me tell you how to think about it. You have 100 rupees, 10% of the portfolio or 10 rupees is the markdown security. It was marked down by 25%. You are at 7.5. So your NAV at the fund level has fallen by 2.5, assuming nothing else has changed. Whether it will come back or not, very difficult to guess. There are some situations, obviously if there's a default, then there's nothing that's going to come back immediately. There may be an eventual recovery one to two years later in which you will get your money back. A downgrade, by the way, is actually not a default. A downgrade is just a lower rating of the instrument from AAA to AA sure. to B, in which case the rating could change if the company's borrowing profile improve so a downgrade is also not a default okay uh, so that's uh, well one simple answer it's horses for courses different funds would have different uh, ways to deal with this and frankly it would depend on what fund that you hold and what a what house is that fund off and therefore um, it will all be dependent on the action that that house takes some people might choose to mark down some people might choose not to mark down so it's all very mo uh, it's it's moving parts really okay let's get to the topic at hand and we talk about that before we sip mitigate these risks quick thoughts from both of you before we get to uh, how do you do it why did you think of uh, sending out this message to your investors either of you can start sure um, so I think the reason we send out the message to the investors is that SIP has become a very popular word. Um, 
everywhere that I travel, you may not know that you're investing in a mutual fund, but you know you're doing an SIP. So that's how popular a word it has become. Um, but sometimes we believe that SIP is the answer to everything. I'll just do an SIP and there is no risk. Um, and one of the reasons to send this out is obviously the last year has been a year of market corrections. So many investors, and I'm being very frank, are feeling that, oh, my one year SIP return is negative or flat and they're feeling disappointed. So we just wanted to set some realistic expectations about when you are going to do an SIP, what fund you should do it in, how long you should do it, what could go wrong, and an SIP is not an FD, it's not going to be risk-free. That's the message that we wanted to send out. So, uh, you know, underlying fund in which you do, do SIP is very, very important. And SIP, if you look at it, has been a solution essentially to deal with the volatility in the market. So one should analyze before doing an SIP uh, because it may be more profitable to do an SIP eventually if the market is going to go up in a more volatile segment. Sure. So that thought must go in before deciding which fund to do SIP in. Is, is that, Harshad, is that one of the reasons why you guys have thought of coming out with a small, small cap based scheme as well because they are just so completely out of favor and so volatile that people might get a better chance of uh, getting getting more units at the same price or something absolutely so i mean last year has been volatile uh, at least next five six months will be volatile and you are absolutely right that this is a very very probably unpopular segment right now because people have not probably it is it is <laughs> yes uh, to the extent that people don't want to talk about it right so that's generally if you look at history that's generally a good time to have a hard look at that segment. Okay, and we'll talk about this uh, fund as well that they have, but let's first talk about the show now and talk about uh, the things at hand. So, we've spoken about the big question. Now, uh, the, the first bit, and I think that's about, you know, you, you've kind of described a person, X, Y, Z, A, B, Z, et cetera, whatever it is, and, uh, you know, there's a monthly SIP going on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it takes care of the thought, the the amounts that you had thought of when you started off, but life is not like that. There is inflation, there are other expenses that start creeping in over a period of five, 10 years as well. Uh, what is it that we are trying to say about this? So one of the things we always tell people is that, you know, if you're planning to save 10,000, usually you do SIPs with a goal. Hmm. And actually I think all investing should be done towards a goal. Hmm. SIPs, because they're my natural long duration, should be with some goal. Now. We don't think about that goal and what 10,000 rupees a month today means. If you're saving for a college education, let's mm. just take that mm. example, and you're saving for a college education abroad, um, 10,000 rupees per month will accumulate a certain corpus. Maybe it will accumulate a crore you know, at some point in time. Will that crore be enough to pay for a college education 10 years later adjusted for inflation? And by the way, in my example, currency depreciation as well. One of the things we actually tell people is to look at an inflation adjusted SIP amount. So we give people a little inflation adjusted SIP calculator. So when you think of SIP, also link it towards your goals and make sure your goals take into account what will be the reality in 2030, not 2020 when you're doing it. Okay, and then if there is an assumption that the market falls, which, which means that there is volatile times ahead, how does one mitigate that risk? Uh, Harsha, that's the question, right? You start an SIP, everything is fine, but the market does fall. And that's a risk for my NAV. It may fall right at the time of my redemption. It may fall in between when I'm doing this investment. How do you mitigate those risks? So, uh, you know, frankly, market falls and therefore the NAV drops. You cannot mitigate that risk at all. The whole idea is that over the course of, you know, if you do it for five years, 10 years, that kind of time horizon, from time to time, the markets will fall. But if you look at the behavior of equity markets over, the, over history, uh, we know that over long periods of time, it has delivered very, very good returns. And SIP would have delivered better returns. The whole assumption in SIP is that eventually the market is trending up, which is why you make money, right, buying low. So you can't completely mitigate the risk. Your NAV will also come down. But if you have, as Radhika was saying, if you have a goal in mind, that helps. So it's possible that your goal, you know, you put the money out for 15 years. In 10 years, your financial goal is achieved. And at that point of time, you should seriously consider whether you should at least you know book part of the profits because ultimately you are investing towards a goal okay interesting so the first example and this is about person xyz is a monthly sip which is 10000 rupees growing to 6 lakh rupees and time frame over 5 years but as i said what if the market were to fall the impact would be the sip of 10000 is not sufficient to average out loss from the market fall is the solution to do a sip top up 
in some cases yes remember as harshit said that when markets fall hmm. you're already buying at lower levels so hmm. firstly an sip investor should not panic when markets right. uh, fall because there is some averaging that happens uh, yes and by the way you know amc's now provide this facility as well that you know on dips for instance you can do an incremental sip for instance we have a facility where if there's a 2% market fall in a day you can add an incremental you can do one more tranche of an sip so it's always for that period for that period that for that day yeah huh. for that month and you you know you can choose the trigger so not only us a lot of people will have those <coughs> kind of facilities but the fundamental thing to keep in mind is that work towards a goal budget according to the goal and you use dips not to stop sips but to top up stopping sips because of a market fall is very very dangerous thing. that's the worst thing that you can do for yourself okay just so that i understand this better uh, this product that you spoke about topping it up at a particular month is it discretionary or is it uh, something that people can tell the amc or the advisor to do that if there is a particular percentage fall yeah. then automatically i have enough money in my bank account automatically one more installment sh should go in subject to the market falling as much how does it work it's exactly like you said neeraj it's called prepaid sip slash stp you choose a threshold whether it's 5 uh, half a percent 1% or 2% and you choose the number of additional installments because you don't want you know the market could be down 20% in a month and you have <laughs> 10 days of 2% falls you don't want 10 triggers so you choose the number of installments per month and then it just does that okay. we've seen that if you do this in a mid cap fund context by the way you use something like the prepaid tool your incremental delta on a 10 year basis is probably about 1% wow. a year which is not bad yeah, which is pretty interesting uh, for pretty, average yeah. or whatever on a, right? and mid cap is as yeah. he said a volatile category so it's the right category to do something like this mm. okay so can i add just yeah, one please thing do. Uh, you know sip by definition this was designed to be non discretionary true if somebody is going to worry about every month's uh, installment going in you know yeah. that defeats the whole purpose hmm. it's meant to be automatic and it works out over a period of time with an underlying assumption that the markets ultimately are heading up yes. which is which has what been the case most of the time so no, so i agree i mean i, I think uh, 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 for everybody who's watching this show or any other show i think uh, uh, all you guys have uh, thankfully spoken about this enough that you know don't panic when the market is down keep it up with the sip so i don't think exactly. people are probably using the discretionary for that but i was wondering if uh, i for my sips as well mm -hmm. i i didn't know about this that i yeah. can have this particular option when the market is falling 3% then two more installments and the same yes, fund can go yes that exists so that's a that's a really interesting tool okay so that's education uh, thanks for that um the other risk that um, invariably would happen as well uh, which is that yes the markets are down but uh, you know the there is a Uh, if i end an sip mm -hmm. or if i believe that i'm shaken up so much that i would want to stop the sip for a time being because the markets have fallen 5% they may fall under 15 20% yeah. what should such an investor do now uh, there is a solution that i believe you guys have suggested and please correct me if i'm wrong but the yeah. solution that you guys have suggested that even if somebody wants to end an sip it would be prudent to end the sip and invest in liquid funds to meet the goal i mm -hmm. mean can you explain this strategy Okay, so the reason we would have suggested this, and you know, two things. One, when you are doing an exit, see what's hmm. the purpose, as he said, of doing an SIP? It's to avoid the point of market timing. Sure. One, when you are exiting the market, you can also do it in a systematic way. Just like there is an SIP, there is something called an SWP. Right. So instead of trying to exit at the top, which you alluded to, by the way, a few you know things uh, earlier, you can exit. then once you've exited the sip the point is not to move back into a bank account the point is to continue investing you may have exited an sip for what reasons you know maybe you genuinely felt nervous because you invested in a mid cap fund and that's not your risk appetite mm. at least keep it in liquid on interest keep the regular habit of saving going or find another product maybe that suits your risk profile and is a little more conservative maybe you exited a mid cap fund but a multi cap fund or a large and mid cap fund is far more comfortable for you so don't stop the habit of saving mm. okay hasha you want to add to this uh, no I, you know i agree with what radhika said one solution there uh, is for investors to keep an sip mm. running without mm. really stopping it mm. at a level which he is comfortable with yeah. and from time to time if the market falls 
he can actually take away because his SIP amount is not something that he cannot afford. Hmm. But at different points of time, whether he can decide whether I want to put a lump sum when the market is down or when the market does a lot better, whether to take that part out and keep the SIP running at a, at a low level, that doesn't really pinch him. Interesting. I have uh, a question of my own and I think which uh, uh, a lot of people probably face is, again, I, I think the topic is apt that before you SIP mitigate the risks. So before people start an SIP into non-equity funds, I think yeah. equity funds people by and large believe they have some ideas. You know, you want more returns to go for a small cap fund over a longer period of time, you'll have more, etc., so on and so forth. I mean, mota moti. But when they're starting off uh, with some corpus that they have, uh, which may be for a period of six months, nine months, 12 months, 24 months, 18 yeah. months, they don't quite, quite have an idea as to whether a short debt, short term debt fund versus uh, something else which is in the fixed income category is a better option versus something else if my time horizon exceeds one year, yeah. then I have a better option. It's a bit of a risk as well. I mean, risk in terms of the quantum of returns that come in. Mm. Uh, what would you advise people to do in such a scenario? I mean, studying it's one thing, but are there some uh, easy to know options available in this category? So, I think firstly an SIP, you know, it's people do it in debt funds, sure. They do it in hybrid funds, but it's really meant for the equity fund because it is goal oriented, it is long term, just as he said. I think if you're investing over one year, firstly, hmm. you should not be investing in equity funds or even hybrid funds. You should be investing in fixed income. Now, fixed income is not inherently very volatile. Again, as ah. Harshad said, you do SIPs in categories that are inherently volatile. So, the only reason for you to do an SIP there would be the second part of SIP is that it keeps you in a monthly habit of saving. So I earn a particular salary a month, say I earn 50,000 rupees a month, my risk profile says 30,000 rupees I SIP into equities, 20,000 rupees I want to be conservative, hence I do an SIP into fixed income. That would really be in my view the only case to do an SIP and instruments like that because a bond fund is largely not so volatile that you need the and it doesn't trend so materially up. But doesn't it, doesn't it form a part of regular savings, Radhika? I mean, for example, I have some money coming in, I have some equity exposure, yes. Yeah. Uh, I have a two-year horizon. I uh -huh. can't invest everything at one go. Yeah. So I want to start an SIP so that it's a fixed sum of money that goes in. Instead of a recurring deposit in a bank, uh -huh. I want to do it in the mutual fund. Okay. And I have a, I mean, so what I'm coming from is that if I'm approaching it with that context, mm. but, uh, uh, but I don't know my time horizon. I mean, or let's say my time horizon is quite unclear whether it's six months or over six months, etc. Right. Should people have a ready reckoner of sorts in their heads? So you can always stagger your investments, right? Okay. Staggering your investments is never a bad idea right. in any as, uh, asset class. It adds value in an asset class that mm. is volatile. Even if you have a lack of rupees to deploy today, you can stagger it out over six months. Staggering also mentally gives us comfort that you know, we've not put money in one turn. Sure. Uh, it appeals psychologically to the investor, but the value added on the SIP I still believe in, you know, Harshad, you can add there is in equity funds. Okay, interesting. Uh, anything else, Harshad, that you believe is something that people ignore while they are either starting an SIP or investing in funds by and large, even if on a lump sum basis? Something that people don't quite pay heed to but should. Uh, so clearly understanding the fund you are investing in is very, very important. Uh, because you are potentially going to invest it for three, five, ten years. Mm. So analyzing the style of the fund manager, whether the you know looking at history and whether the mandate is taken seriously or not uh, that these these are some of the things which are very very important and liquidity analysis of the fund portfolio is also very very important okay so let's try and understand one of the funds that people might want to invest in and that is a fund that is coming out from your stable which is the Edelweiss small cap fund right now why what kind of investor should approach this fund why have you guys decided to come out with a small cap fund at a time when small caps are being shunned <coughs> and what's the kind of return expectations that people should have from a from an instrument like this sure so i'll start with the first half and then maybe harshit can talk about the opportunity in small caps um i think small caps are a part of your asset allocation but it is a very long term investment so you're investing in small caps hopefully with a 5 to 7 year time horizon and know, as he said, that it is a risky asset class. It's an important asset class because we genuinely do believe that there is alpha to be earned in small cap companies. Some of the larger companies today were once small caps. I mean, every tree had an origin in something very, mm. very small. But know that smaller companies by nature are going to be far more volatile than a very, very large established company. So work with an advisor, it should be part of your asset allocation. It is a 
high risk but high return category. That's the preamble and hence mitigate it by investing for the long term. Okay. And you know, frankly, you mentioned why are you coming out with a uh, with this fund when equities, uh, small caps are being shunned. In fact, we are coming out with it because small caps are being shunned. Yeah. Typically, this is a good time to invest. We have just uh, seen 2018 being the worst year on the record for small caps compared to large caps. Mm. At the index level, small caps underperformed large caps by 31 percentage points. The last worst year was 2008 when they underperformed by 17 percentage points. Okay, so one is precisely because uh, you know it is unpopular. Secondly, uh, we analyzed many small cap companies, businesses, as to what exactly happened in 2018. Hmm. And we realized that there are many businesses where the fundamentals were in fact intact. In, in reality, many of them were improving. Still the stocks fell. As I said, index fell by 28%. Many stocks have fallen by 30, 40, 50%. As a result of which, a lot of froth that had built into the small cap universe through 2016, 17, a lot of it is out of the way. So many of them are genuinely looking attractive mm. uh, in terms of valuations. And you know, it's very rare that in the Indian market, you get both the earnings growth to be at prospective earnings growth attractive and valuations reasonable. I think that is a rare combination you have in small and mid caps. At the same time, I again want to reiterate what Radhika said. Uh, by its very nature, this is a riskier part of the equity market. Volatility is inherent in this asset class and therefore uh, investors should keep that in mind only investors with good risk appetite and the asset allocation should also take into account that this is a riskier part of the investment. Over longer period, it is likely to deliver very good returns, but it will be choppy along the way. You know, I'll, I'll throw in one more statistic out here. Um, if you look at the last 10 years and look at the BSC 500, the, the companies uh, in terms of size from 401 to 500, in 2017, 98% of that universe delivered positive returns. In 2018, it was a measly 18%. So it is, a, it is uh, the, the, the side of the market which is shunned right now. But as they said, they've analyzed the fundamentals and some of those fundamentals, some of those companies appear robust and may pour, maybe therefore the valuation are certainly in your favor in order to buy this. Uh, last question on this fund, yeah. you would presume, I mean, you would recommend that anybody who's applying to the NFO mm -hmm. or maybe buying in over the period of the next six months to 12 months should buy it with a minimum three year, five year horizon or even longer? So I'll say two things. Uh, yes, uh, five years ideally and, and longer. I think it's a long term asset class. Uh, since we're talking about SIPs, we've done something reasonably innovative in the fund. Everyone talks to us when we go out saying the next five months are going to be volatile. We have an election ahead. Um, so we've created an option which we highly recommend for investors called STEP. If you have a crore or if you have 10 lakhs to put today, what it will do is it will take two lakhs and park them today and the balance for Will four tranches will happen over the next four months. It's like a systematic transfer plan. It's a systematic transfer plan. It's called Smart Trigger Enable Plan. And it also does a little bit of what I alluded to earlier in the show. If the market falls 3%, it prepawns the investment a little bit. So it's a very smart way to do all the things we would normally do. Invest systematically, take advantage of market dips, and all have technology do it for you so that you don't have the discretion that you talked about showing in. So we highly recommend that people look at STEP as a facility, and that's what people have been doing so far. Okay, interesting. Let's wait and watch if that succeeds. And, and hopefully the fund, and, and you know, if, if this fund were to do well, and I certainly hope, I'm sure it will, it will also stand vindication to the fact that the markets eventually will follow that rising trajectory that Harshad was speaking about. So indeed hoping for that as well. Um, well, do we have time for any queries? Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll just uh, call it a day. Okay, we have a couple of uh, queries and maybe we can just quickly take them. Vivian uh, asks if his child, which is three years old and needs money when he turns 18 for a higher education, does an SIP of 5,000 rupees every month for 15 years help? Okay, I'm bad with math. I'm not that great at Excel. Harsha, do you want to take it? Uh, no, I yeah, think the technology has spoiled all of us. Uh -huh. At one point of time, I would have done it mentally. Mentally. Yeah. Very tough. Yeah, so <laughs> fight was a 16 to 15. That's about 9 lakh rupees, just the capital. Yeah. And then maybe uh, add on to that. Uh, 
You would reckon that would be a bit less, even adjusted for the returns that would come in, maybe? If I suspect so, given that you'd have inflation. Again, my math is terrible. But the point is, I mean, you know, one should get started towards that hmm. goal. So when you have a kid, I think doing an SIP fundamentally in the name of the child. And also remember, Vivian or the viewer, his income will increase. So maybe sure. you start with five, right? Who's to say that SIP won't become a 7,000 and a 10,000? And a, why does the SIP amount have to be static? So don't be disheartened, I think, by the fact that today it won't meet the goal. Your earnings also go up. We often forget, you know, that we, we have children, but we are also growing. Our incomes yeah. are growing. Yeah, that too. And and frankly, yes, I, I presume um, uh, higher education abroad might be really expensive, but higher education in India, yes, uh, with some step ups, etc., you might be actually be able to meet your goal. So, yeah, I, I think as Radhika said, don't get disheartened. I have one final query, though, if I can. If I invest in a small cap fund right now, and if I park that money for 10 years, is there a reasonable chance that my returns would beat uh, the nifty returns and arguably a well-managed large cap fund return as well? I'm giving you a horizon of 10 years. Yeah. So I will answer that question slightly differently. I will say within 10 years, uh, the odds are very, very high that you know if you invest in small caps today, you will earn significantly better returns than large caps. The reason for saying within is exactly that after 10 years, there will be another election and there will be another volatility. But within 10 years, there is there are very, very good probability, yes. Okay, that's a smart answer too, okay. <laughs> well, step up on the answers as well as Edelweiss AMC doing. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, both of you for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. And thanks Thank for you. giving us uh, a lowdown on some things that people can do as well uh, on perceived risks or otherwise. And viewers, thanks for tuning into this leg of the Mutual Fund Show. Uh, stay tuned to Blue McQueen.